Hello and welcome to Vermont Craft Beer Night. This is Meet the Brewer, where we introduce you to some of the people that have helped put Vermont Craft Beer on the map. This is Destiny Saxon, who is at uh, Zero Gravity at American Flatbread in Burlington, Vermont. And Mike Gerhart from Otter Creek Brewing in Middlebury, Vermont, which is where I took a crew to drill a little bit deeper into a brewery that is not necessarily your father's Otter Creek. dissolved oxygen, the turbidity, the CO2 content, the alcohol content, I've used, you know, you could be as scientific about this stuff as you want and sit down and do your calculations, but the best beers um, that you're ever going to drink usually come from a session of drinking beers, drinking other people's beers within a drive of my house here in Ripton. Uh, there's like five or six breweries that I haven't even been to yet or tried their beers yet, so it's pretty exciting to go and see what's out there and what's new and what people are getting excited about. There's a lot of great brewers in the state, you know? Uh, it's great, it keeps everybody on their toes, but you know, the commonality with this crew is the love of beer. And what you find a lot with professional brewers is that obviously home brewing is um, pretty much across the board. Everyone's at least gotten their first batches through a five gallon system or whatever before they really got bit by the bug and went big with it. That, and that's what's great about this industry also, that you know, when you go to conferences and brew festivals, so much creative energy comes out of it. And we joke all the time, like if you went to an electronics um, trade show, the guys from Samsung and Apple are not going, we should make a phone together. You know, this industry is totally different. This past summer, Sean Lawson and, and I got together and we did Double Dose, uh, which was a one-off collaboration brew, and uh, put out the, uh, the signal on social media that anyone that grew hops in the state of Vermont, if they wanted to donate them to the cause, we used fresh wet hops in the brew, and it blew up. It was unbelievable. And that beer that ended up coming from this creative process was just epic. And I went to this bar in Connecticut. The bar apparently got the only keg of this beer in the whole state of Connecticut. And it was called the Backstage Bar because it was next to a theater. And when we pulled up, I was in awe that I was wondering what show was at the theater that night because there was a line around the block. And they were like, no, man, these people are here for the beer. And that just blew my mind. I was like, wow. This is, this is happening. You know, right now, we're all just kind of really enjoying the ride. If you do this, you're not doing this to become wealthy, uh, you know, and have a vacation home in Costa Rica. You're doing it because you've dedicated your life to something you love. And I think people see some honor in that. And because of that, it kind of transcends. You have no idea how many people come up to you and they're like, you have the greatest job in the world, and you kind of look at them and go, you have no idea what we do on a daily basis. I mean, we clean all day, we're scrubbing floors, and um, it's hot, real hot in the summer. The puddles freeze in the winter. It's loud. You know, I hear the bottles clanging in my head when I go to sleep at night, but it's something amazing, too, at the end of the day, you know, to be able to sit down at the bar and hold this up and say, all right, we did that. It's something pretty special. This brew is part of me. I want to come here every day. So, Mike, you have been billed as Vermont's best kept secret in, in the Vermont craft brew world. And I think part of that is something that we touched on when we, when we came down to visit you. Uh, and that's the story of how you got into brewing. Yeah, that's uh, my, my now career that pays my way through life started with crime. So. Um, little known fact, but yeah, you know, I was uh, quite a rambunctious kid running around the streets of New York City with way too much energy and time on my hands. And luckily, a probation officer at the age of 14 told my parents when they picked me up from what they called camp, where they would come get me once in a while, um, said, get this kid a hobby or he's going for the extended stay. And my folks got me a beer kit and it changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> So there was ground rules, you know, beer had to be consumed at home, only with my father. Tasting notes had to be uh, detailed on every batch of beer. Um, one big thing my dad said, the first batch of beer I remember, I took a sip, went to dump it in the sink, saying it's awful, and grabbed my hand, 
said we never dump a single bottle you drink all of them it's one thing to know what makes a great beer but it's another thing to know what makes a bad beer and you're going to know it over and over again and um, to this day the first batch is a beer of a new beer that come off the line at the brewery pops gets a six pack before the public ever gets it he always has of all the breweries i've kind of traveled around brewing at since 96 and it worked out I, uh, for the most part, have stayed away from the law ever since. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, we also have Destiny Saxon up here from Zero Gravity Brewing at Flatbread in Burlington, Vermont. And uh, our, one of our producers, Dorothy Dickey, actually went down uh, to give uh, Flatbread a visit. Welcome to Zero Gravity Craft Brewery. Yeah, American Flatbread, Burlington Hearts. It is an old building. It's I think from the 1800s. There's a lot of nooks and crannies in the basement. I, I think it was a challenge to get the brewery in here. This restaurant, American Flatbread in Burlington, was opened about 10 years ago. There are other flatbreads in Vermont, but this is the only one with a brewery. We usually try to have about 12 beers on draft that are, you know, cover all the bases. This is our Conehead IPA. It's, um, it's our, one of our flagships. It's, uh, it's a really nice beer for um, getting people into hops, I think, because it's such a citrusy hop, it pulls a lot of people in. This is our our extra dry stout. This is a beer that I think might have been the first beer brewed here. Um, it's a little bit stronger than Guinness. Um, this is our Berliner Weiss, which is a sour German wheat beer. Normally for the other beers, we, we ferment with yeast. For the Berliner Weiss, we have to use lactobacillus bacteria. The uh, bacteria is what makes the beer sour. Uh, right now I'm just loading um, the mill, about 650 pounds of malt that we're going to be using for today's brew, which is a German uh, smoked lager. Mm. It's a very um, subtle smoke in this malt, and they smoke it in Bomberg, Germany. I should probably not have the mouthful when I talk to you. And this is... Um, getting augered upstairs to the second floor where the brewery is. A one batch of beer is usually 12 to 13 barrels. Me and Justin, we're definitely kicking, you know, over a tank a week. So, you know, that's over 400 gallons. On September 1st, we'll be starting construction on a new Zero Gravity Brewery on Pine Street in Burlington. Hopefully we'll be brewing in December. And it's gonna be a 30 barrel brew house, so three times as big as what we're making right now. We'll be canning the flagships and maybe bottling special releases. I just home brewed a lot for two years and then I was working at an environmental lab and I thought, well, you know, I might like to do brewing. It just seemed like a really cool thing to be able to do. I was at Otter Creek for almost four years, and then I came to Flatbread full time. So I've been here for six years. 2.6 ounces in the kettle of each. Okay. There's definitely less women brewers than men, but uh, there's several women brewers in Vermont. I don't think that it's tough for a woman to get into the brewing industry. I've never had any, any trouble. I never once felt discriminated against. And I just feel like if you're into brewing, you know, that's what you go for. And you have to know what you're doing. Um, you have to know your equipment. You have to know the beer styles that you're going for. Being a brewer fits my personality just because I'm not sitting at a desk. I'm not behind a computer. I'm moving and um, I'm also a very quiet, introverted person and uh, I think the brewing industry has helped me be a little more social than I might be otherwise. It gets me out there. 
This is our first time at Zero Gravity, so we're just learning the different beers that they have. Good flavor. I compared it well to an English beer. Yeah. It's just very complex and refreshing at the same time. It's pretty good. I'd buy it again, let's put it that way. <laughs> We appreciate the artisan feel of the, the craft brewery where you can meet the people who are actually making it and you appreciate the quality more. Cheers. Whenever a customer tells me that they think I did a really good job achieving a certain style, that makes me feel pretty good. Uh, I guess any compliment is nice. <laughs> so, Destiny, uh, in the piece we uh, heard about the 12 beers that you're usually trying to juggle at zero gravity um, and off camera we uh, heard you talking about how that really helps with the creativity of the, the brewing process um, for us beer geeks we're, we're here because we're beer geeks um, get, can you give us some insight into that into the creativity um, well I guess for the uh, the brew pub we we have um, four fermenters and um, 14 serving tanks, so we have a lot of space to um, to age beer and have that many on tap. So we're lucky that we can we can put out more beers than most most breweries because it's a brew pub. And um, our goal is to have a really well-rounded list for the customers. Um, so we have dark beer, we have light beer, we have bitter, we have not bitter, we have. You know, so I always have a, a framework, and I look at the list and I see what we have, and I see what gaps we have to fill. And um, you know, this week I uh, I decided I'll make black IPA because um, a couple of our I other IPAs are going to be kicking, and it's going to be September soon. So it's a really nice luxury to be in a brew pub and be able to do whatever you want to some degree. Excellent. Um, before we start taking questions from the audience here, um, you you also are not opposed to tweaking formulas that you have for like even your flagship beers. Is that true? Yeah, no. I mean, some beers we're perfectly happy with, but um, I was mentioning to you earlier that I I did a, a study group with uh, a bunch of home brewers. Uh, someone in the audience is here who was in the group, and um, we met every week for about a year and every week we would take one beer style and someone would gather up the beers and we would taste it, talk about it, and then at the end of a year we took a test on beer styles and throughout that time I realized that some of our beers, like the the English Dark Mild, that could be a little more malty or, you know, this beer could be a little more bitter and so I, you know, I have the ability to change things because I don't have my beer in bottles out on the marketplace that, uh, you know, someone has already bought and they expect that again. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Mike or Destiny? Just step right up to the mic. Um, I'll, I'll ask Mike a question here since he's been sitting there for a while. So Mike, um, I mean, we talked about this a little bit when I came down. Uh, the documentary Beer Wars, um, you were actually in that film uh, with uh, um, Sam Calagione. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Calagione uh, yeah. from Dogfish Head. Um, so you were working with him at the time, and you were how old? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure of the age. I don't know. I usually couldn't tell you what I had for lunch yesterday, but it's, uh, <laughs> I've been on Otter Creek seven years. The four years prior, I was the R&D brewer for Dogfish and also their distillery manager. So um, those days were pretty wild because the, this craft industry has kind of progressed. And, you know, this woman, Annette, I believe her name was, um, you know, Sam was very uh, good about just like dropping journalists or people off and saying like, just hang with this guy for a day and like you find out there's like an article in Discover Magazine or something and you got all these F-bombs all over a magazine and you didn't even realize who you're hanging out with. But um, Michael Jackson, the epic beer writer, he's like, you got to drive this guy to the airport and throws this guy in the car. It was kind, kind of a crazy time. It was before this industry really got to this place it is now. but. Um, yeah, she filmed for a while, and we were doing some pretty weird stuff. I had the, the extras of that movie uh, as a little segment on 
Um, I found these berries uh, with Sam that only grow above the Arctic Circle called cloudberries, and we had this tribe pick them and had them shipped in. And apparently, the U.S. Customs had a major issue with it, and they were quarantined in Newark Airport for I don't know how long. And we went up there, and he talked to some woman customs agent why I took the berries and loaded up my Volkswagen with them, and. Um, <laughs> She put this all in a movie, and it was totally not legal, and, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, when we did the math afterward, it was a great beer, but we said, uh, even if we charged $100 a pint at the pub, you know, we lost money on it, but it was, <laughs> it was cool, you know, wow. something to do, so, <laughs> so, yeah, cool. but times have changed. Yeah, yeah, and I recommend, if you haven't seen Beer Wars yet, it's a really well done documentary, and, uh, yeah, and Mike was featured in it so slightly. This, Sam was a, a main player in that. Uh, and and uh, the big story for me was that uh, his sort of answer to the Budweiser buyout, the Anheuser-Busch buyout, was sort of a, you know, no. And he quadrupled his output of his craft brewer. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so Destiny, um, you know, we've talked about, um, you in the piece, you talked about brewing beer with bacteria. Uh, fermenting beer with bacteria. Um, I remember going to Zero Gravity and actually having a beer without hops in it. Can you mm. tell us about that? Yeah, that's um, something we've been doing since the very beginning um, of being a brewery. The brewery opened like a year after Flatbread opened and um, Paul Saylor, who is the owner and one of the brewers, he um, from the very beginning wanted to do these Grua ales, which are a medieval style of beer. There, what beer was in England and Europe 700 years ago, there wasn't any, like, uh, the, like the recipes were not like add hops he here, add hops here. It was use this herb, this herb, this herb, and um, hops might have been a part of that, but um, it was a, it wasn't the main ingredient, and um, and so we we do it twice a year uh, for the solstices. And uh, I've been working a couple new gruets in throughout the year. Like I just made a carrot beer, and um, we're gonna add some herbs to that. But um, it's something we bring to festivals, and people really remember us for that one. Um, so we'll always keep gruets high on the list. That's amazing, pushing the boundaries. So actually, we have a question. Hi, I'm Mike Early, and uh, really enjoy all your beers, uh, most of the beers. I don't think I've tried. I didn't realize you had that many, uh, Destiny. Um, but I did have a question because I just saw in the video that you're going to expand, and it mentioned can you're going to have a can or canning operation there. Um, are you going to adjust any of the recipes for keeping the flavor intact for the can, or you do you have to do consider that or not? Um, I think we're lucky that um, the new brewery is going to be in the same city because when you change um, locations and the water changes, a lot of, you have to kind of work your way back to, um, you know, like the beer is 90 something percent water, so you have to have that be the same. So we have that luxury of not having to tweak that. Um, the only thing we'll have to do is, you know, with the scale up to see if, um, you know, what amount of changes, like little tweaks, to additions are gonna create the same flavor. But I, I mean, we're not gonna change the beer. We're gonna try to keep it as as much like it is now as possible. Right, I just didn't know if, if because of the canning, it can affect the flavor. How, you know, Conehead, for instance, tastes mm -hmm. great, but I've never had any other way other than on draft, so. Yeah, the only um, fear is oxidation, because, you know, once, what I really like about the pub is that um, you have a pint there and it came right from the tank mm -hmm. and as soon as it goes into a growler or a can or a bottle and you take it outside it's potentially not the same. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you Mike. Uh, part of the what you do Mike at Otter Creek is to brew Wooliver's organic beer um, can you give us a little bit of insight into the organic process and what, how that's different and what that means to you? Sure. I mean, uh, obviously the ingredients are different by nature being certified organic. Uh, there's certain things that have to go into play as far as spatial relations of where you store your ingredients. They have to be physically separated from others, clearly labeled. 
um, color coded. Uh, if you happen to have people that you know couldn't read the labels, things of that Two nature, but uh, it's uh, um, more or less you know the beer. The biggest difference I'd say brewing organic beer is when I order or buy organic hops. I call the farmer who's on the tractor. I have his cell phone, um, and when we buy the crop, we buy it when he harvests it and payments in full, and we take all the hops. When you're buying conventional hops, you're buying. Uh, through brokers, contracting out different years, you don't really know where your hops are coming from. They're just going through a middleman. Um, you know the quality's there, but um, that's one thing that's very important to us with Wolliver's that the sustainable agriculture piece that we have a connection with where everything's coming from. We have to be able to um, through a certification process and every year in the audit to they put a bottle on the desk and I have to be able to show every ingredient that went into that, every truck and company that that ingredient was handled by all the way back to that acreage of farm where that ingredient came from. All the ingredients that go into the Wolliver's beers taste, smell, uh, look just as great as the stuff in the other brands. They're twice the price because um, it's harder for them to grow. Uh, a lot more goes into it. Everyone's got this overhead of keeping these government bodies uh, in certification, but it's, it's just a piece that we um, we feel very strongly about, and that's why, obviously, if the ingredients cost twice, we don't charge twice for a six-pack. Our other brands subsidize the Wolliver's brand because we're trying to build the organic beer business, and with that, prices will soften for all other players involved, um, but it's just something we feel strongly about. All right. We have another question? Yeah, I'm John from Cloverdale. Uh, first of all, thank you for introducing me to Druitt. Uh, I've tried making a few on my own, and some crazy things have happened, but um, uh, I'm curious if either of you think that Vermont will ever have a signature style, like a West Coast IPA or the European regionals. I'm just curious of your take on that. I feel like um, we kind of, we do have, we are going in that direction. Um, I just kind of feel like our IPAs are a class of their own. Um, people kind of expect a hazy IPA when they're in Vermont, um, but I've always wondered, you know, what what would be the Vermont style? And um, you know, I don't I don't think we're quite there yet, but there's so many breweries happening right now. We might might find a few. No, I, I agree with Destiny uh, with that. I mean, we we've we've spoken about that at the brewery multiple times, where guys in marketing will say you should make an East Coast IPA and brewers pull back and go, well, what is that, you know? Um, but I think a lot of that kind of push that's going on with brewers like myself and Destiny and the IPAs in Vermont right now, um, a lot of what's going on and how Vermont's blowing up is because, um, you know, a bunch of our friends would, would you know, want to argue about it, but they're spoiled out on the East Coast or the West Coast. Any hop that we brew a beer with that isn't found at a local farm spends like seven days on a truck. These guys out in the Yakima Valley and whatnot can go down and brew wet hop beers and just roll up to the farm and get hops fresh off the vine, make these crazy beers. I mean, we're in a different spot. You know, a lot of our brewers at Otter Creek, I mean, we're putting 75,000 bottles down the line every day and hops to them are things that come in a cardboard box on a truck. They're not driving past fields with trellises and whatnot. And I think that makes us work harder. You know, we're, we're not spoiled. It's hard for us. We're building in freight costs into our beer uh, bill of material costs, and we're trying to figure out more creative ways to work with our hops and how they work in the whirlpool, how they work in the dry hops, how they work in the kettle. Um, we're hungry, you know. We're, 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 uh, we're going to give them a run for their money from the agricultural product of where they live, and we're on the other side of the, the whole mass of land. So, nice. Hungry you know. and hearty. Absolutely. We have uh, one more question from the audience. Hi, I'm uh, Bill from South Burlington, and Bill. I have a question for Mike. And on behalf of avid beer consumers uh, all over, I want to thank you for the rescue of the Shed brand. And uh, I was wondering if you could give us some uh, insight on, on how that happened and how you managed to, to come by saving Shed, and, and also are there any other Shed uh, beers coming out in the near future? Well, Almost seems like that one was prompted. Um, so, Shed, um, uh, it's a it's a really cool story, especially personally for myself. Um, uh, my first 
brewing job in the mid to late 90s was when I was a Johnson State student going through college. I paid my way through college brewing beer. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the shed. Uh, and um, it was one of those things that when Ken Strong called and said that the lease was up and uh, he was gonna need someone to contract brew but he wasn't sure when or how long it was gonna be until the new place opened, um, would we brew the beer? Uh, there was a twofold thing there that um, yes we would brew the beer uh, we didn't know where uh, things were going to go for him and Stowe and also uh, the head brewer at the shed at the time uh, Jim uh, both of us used to brew together at Magic Hat and so we basically asked Ken as a company if he would sell us the brand um, and we also got Jim to come brew with us and we basically got the band back together and uh uh, and like what Destiny alluded to earlier, it was pretty funny. We basically brewed those recipes of the shed, hands down, as the recipe sheets from Stowe dictated, and people were like, what'd you do to the beer? You ruined it. And it was completely because we didn't have a direct fire kettle, we have a steam-fired kettle, our, the geometry of our fermenters are different, our water's different, so we had to go back and completely blow the recipe up and change it and everyone said oh you finally made it the way it was again the recipe <laughs> is night and day so jim uh and i are working together on all the recipes uh as of right now it's just the mountain ale and the ipa uh this year uh we've also done uh the nosedive was a uh, vanilla robust vanilla porter uh last year's a seasonal we have another year round coming uh late winter early spring there will be a variety pack coming uh I'd say second quarter of uh, next year. So it's, uh, it's evolving, but it's, it's defying all uh, business models right now for craft beer in Vermont. Everyone wants hops, hops, hops. And I've seen the data, uh, Shed Mountain Ale is the number one selling craft six pack in the state of Vermont at this point. And it's hot, it's summer, and it's seven and a half percent alcohol brown ale. And it's defying the business model. So, um, so we couldn't be any happier with partnering up and Ken's a staple at our pub in Middlebury so <laughs> as he was in Stowe so all right well I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions that was very nice and uh, thank you Mike and Destiny for joining us and talking with us thank you enjoy the rest of the brew fest <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.